uh, introducing it to astronomy as a history st subject for study in Australia. And most of you will know that Australia was claimed by the British uh, after the arrival of Captain Cook in, on our eastern shoreline. Now, Captain Cook was by no means the first person to come to Australia, and the Dutch, of course, were involved in Western Australia uh, much before Cook. But Cook arrived in Australia in 1770 on an expedition which itself was a piece of astronomy history. Cook was commissioned by the Royal Society in London to go to the Pacific with a small boat and some scientists to observe the transit of Venus in 1769. And, and at that time, that was considered one of the major scientific projects of the time. It was to determine something very extremely fundamental, that is how far away the sun is, or at least how far away the earth is from the sun, or what we nowadays call the, the uh, astronomical unit. Up to that stage, we knew the ratio of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, etc. We knew the ratio of their orbital size, but we didn't have a yardstick to, for that. So Cook was involved in the transit of Venus in 1769. After he finished the, in Tahiti, he came to Australia, crossed to, and claimed the east coast of Australia for the, for the crown. In 1788, Australia's first white permanent settlers arrived in what, was, what we now call the uh, First Fleet. And as part of that fleet, there was a lieutenant by the name of Dawes, and his job was to set up a small observatory in Sydney with the intention of doing, well, two things. First one was to start, establish a time service, a clock service for the colony. And of course, you will know from your history that clocks, sextants, ships, navigation and longitude all go together and they were the basic power of the British naval industries and, and forces. So getting a time service set up in Australia was a very, very, very important thing. So Dawes was given the job of doing that. But he, he was also trained at um, Greenwich Observatory and he had uh, a, a couple of other uh, objectives and that was to find some comets, for example. He also very interesting character. Uh, a very interesting character in that he took a real keen interest in the indigenous peoples of Australia. And if you can find in the bookshops a book by Kate Gren Grenfell uh, called The Lieutenant, uh, it, it is a novel, historically based novel, about Dawes and his interaction mainly with the Aboriginal peoples. He was one of the first pe first uh, white man, if you like, to study the Aboriginal language and to try and come to groups with that. Okay, uh, the observatory there was only there for a few years. In fact, Dawes left uh, uh, left the uh, left Australia. Uh, as I understand it, he was given a command by the governor at the time to uh, execute effectively some Aboriginal peoples, and he, I think, I believe he did do that. He actually. Uh, organised the executions, but he did not feel comfortable with it at all, and he um, uh, left the colony. Okay, so the colony obviously then needed a much more permanent astronomical facility, and the governor, the third governor, second governor, sent to Australia for uh, governing the colony was Brisbane. Now, Brisbane uh, was in fact a amateur astronomer, and he already had built an observatory in Scotland. So as well as being a, a naval man and a man of governance, uh, he was also an amateur astronomer. So when he came to Australia, he built a small observatory in the grounds of what is now called Government House in Parramatta. Uh, that uh, building has long since gone, and uh, what's left there now is, uh, I'll come to that, but is not very much. Um, 
but the uh, at that observatory he had employed uh, two uh, professional astronomers. I say that very carefully. Uh, certainly one of them went on to become a very famous professional astronomer and the other one uh, was probably, uh, well he has an interesting history as well. So let's come back to that. Uh, so the observatory had several telescopes. The small one was a three, roughly a three inch aperture refracting telescope uh, which was used just for general astronomical observations and there, were a, a tra there was a transit circle and, uh, and a thing called a mural circle. What happened was that, uh, uh, interesting, oh, okay, I'll come to that too. Okay, so now at, 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 at the park in Parramatta, uh, there are now only two stones remaining of the observatory. Now, before you all start to laugh, that is actually me. Uh, uh, a very long time ago, uh, back when I used to be a uh, much more young man, and that car in the background called with the green, the pink and grey FB Holden was what was called the uh, the Galar car. Okay, so these two stones now are the uh, are the, the, the east and west pillars of the transit circle, which was at Parramatta. And the transit circle instrument itself is that brass instrument which is now kept in the archives at Sydney Observatory. Uh, the, uh, the, the refracting telescope is here uh, in two, um, two photographs. One, a, a very old photograph showing what it looked like about 18, late 1800s and a modern one which I took myself um, where the instrument's been totally restored. As I said, this is only about a three inch aperture instrument. The uh, observatory also had uh, uh, this pillar, these, the, these pillars uh, for uh, other parts of the instruments and a instrument which was there to measure magnetic fields. Right, so uh, now the observatory itself lasted from 1822 through to 1855 and uh, Brisbane of course was the protagonist and the man who paid for it and he paid for the astronomers to be there. Um, there were three maybe three major pieces of work that come from the observatory. The first one is what's called the Brisbane catalogue and it is a catalogue of star positions in the southern skies um, 7,000, was it 385 to be precise, uh, which were measured at the observatory. Uh, that This particular publication was published um, uh, quite a while after the observatory closed and there was a lot of conjecture in the scientific community as to who actually did the work and who should take the credit. The old joke, the old story of course, that he who does the work does not get necessarily get the same credit as he who pays for it. Uh, so, uh, but, and this, this particular piece of work was pioneering in that it, it established a catalogue of bright stars in the southern sky which had never been done before. The catalogue itself uh, is, this is a, a section of it, uh, page one to be precise, and you can see there that the, uh, it's just a, a table of 7,000 385 lines and each line has the uh, name of the constellation, the name of the star and its right ascension and declination which are the two coordinates which determine its position in the sky uh, and uh, some other information and some uh, uh, information concerning how far those positions will appear to move as a consequence of the precession of the Earth's axis. Okay, now let me just digress for a second. Uh, seeing I'm giving this talk in Brisbane, it's probably appropriate to, to point out that uh, this city of Brisbane, which is now a city of uh, 3,000, 3 million, yes. 300, yeah. 3 million people, uh, is in fact named after Sir Thomas McDougall of Brisbane. And, uh, uh, and the, 
in the city there's a very fine planetarium called the called the uh, Brisbane Planetarium and inside there you'll find a, uh, a, a, a copper bust of the man himself plus also some quite relevant information about his history what he did after he left uh, Australia. Uh, I don't know that his visit to Australia was a happy one. People were saying that uh, there, are, there is comments in the historic literature about someone who spent more time with the stars and less time with, with governments. But, of course, everybody's a critic. Uh, in Brisbane also, up on Petrie Terrace, thank you, uh, there is a, a building, a, a structure like this, which uh, maybe we should go and have a look at tomorrow, <coughs> Pardon me, which is actually an old windmill. It's a... Um, uh, was originally a windmill to, to grind flour, but uh, at one point in its history it was used as a focal point for the time service and there was uh, associated with it technical people who could set the clocks, etc. In other words, it was the Brisbane Observatory. Uh, also, in its uh, chequered history, it was also used at one point as a uh, yard arm to hang uh, dissidents and, and other people. Part of our happy, glorious history. Okay, so let's go back to Parramatta itself, back to the, to the place, uh, and uh, talk a little bit more detail about what was done there. Okay, there were three astronomers. It was Brisbane, Governor, part-time astronomer, some would argue full-time astronomer, part-time Governor, uh, a German fellow by the name of Rumka and a, and, a, and a Scottish fellow by the name of Dunlop. Now, the, let's talk firstly about Dunlop. Uh, Dunlop uh, did, was a, it appears possibly quite an argumentative fellow and um, interesting personality, shall we say. And he uh, generated a catalogue of double stars and also he generated a catalogue of non-stellar objects, that is, objects in the sky which were not stars. In those days, uh, the differentiation between clusters, nebula, globular clusters, emission, uh, blah, 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 that was not quite as clear as it is today. You were either a star or you weren't a star. So these were non-stellar objects. And here, uh, this is a schematic of uh, Dunlop 8. The delta indicates that it was done, measured, discovered by Dunlop. And, uh, and also Dunlop 411, uh, nebular object, which is nowadays called NGC 4945. It's a beautiful edge-on spiral galaxy in Centaurus. And down below in the little boxy, uh, you can see a drawing Dunlop, done, done by Dunlop himself showing where it is and what it looks like. Uh, now a bit about the man himself. Uh, born in Scotland, came into in astronomy. Okay, he was constructing his own telescopes back as far as 1810. In 1820 he became acquainted with, with, uh, Dun with Brisbane and Brisbane brought him to Australia. Uh, I'm not sure if that was first prize or second prize but, but probably scientifically it was certainly like winning the lottery because uh, here's the whole southern skies never done in any way seriously before and he was the man. Uh, now this slide may be a bit hard to read but if you, let me just read it to you. It says between 1823 and February uh, 1826 he made 40,000 observations and catalogued some 7,385 7, stars, of which 166 were double, and blah, blah, blah. Um, now, he had a little altercation over, over some of this stuff, and he left the observatory and established uh, his own mini observatory, if you like, in his backyard in Parramatta, and there he went and surveyed the, sky, the southern sky for the, for the nebulas. Um, the, his work was really considered to be absolutely brilliant until 
until in the 1830s uh, a well-established gentleman astronomer from the UK by the name of John Herschel. He was the son of the fellow who discovered the planet Uranus. Um, uh, went to South Africa, Cape Town to be precise, and undertook his own survey of the southern sky. And the situation was that he believed that he could not reconcile his own observations with those of Dunlop for the nebular objects. And as a consequence, the uh, Dunlop went from being a very famous first scientist to get into the Southern Hemisphere to being somewhat discredited. And um, in passing, as a digression, I had a student uh, do a PhD uh, a few years ago on this very subject where we took modern observations and Dunlop's observations and Herschel's observations and reconciled them. We did actually discover quite a few flaws in the Dunlop's observations, one of which appeared that he had uh, uh, a rather poor quality clock. Now, a lot of astronomy is done with clocks and his clock was possibly wrong and uh, that gave him various offsets in his positions. So uh, I guess the jury is, uh, probably, probably the jury is in. Uh, he was the pioneer, he did a lot of good work but most probably one would argue that he didn't to do it as well as he should have done. Okay, um, here be the man and his lovely wife. Um, you can see that uh, I, I will bet that the uh, offspring from this particular relationship had a big nose, that would be my guess. Okay, now um, I referred to the, my graduate student uh, who did this work and you'll see here a uh, copy of the Sky and Telescope magazine, a very famous um, astronomy magazine from a few years back and uh, and uh, you see the gems of the southern hemisphere uh, uh, cover page story and that cover page story is in fact about Dunlop's catalogue and here you see Dunlop's catalogue uh, description of, um, of, a, of a galaxy which has an unusual sort of hamburger shape to it and uh, that's his description there and if, you go, if I go to the next slide, I've taken that, simply taken that drawing, turned it through the right appropriate angle, and you can see immediately that it is in fact uh, the, the cover of the magazine. So the cover photograph of the magazine is, is a well-known galaxy called MGC 5128 in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it is also a source of very powerful radio, obs uh, radio emission. Uh, it's probably, it is the closest and most powerful radio galaxy and uh, of course Centaurus A. Uh, so here's uh, Dunlop's drawing and here's the cover of Sky and Telescope magazine and once I've shown you what the, the linkage I'm sure it's pretty obvious what's going on. Okay, uh, right, astronomer number two, his name was Rumpke. Uh, Rumpke was uh, German uh, he was involved in the star catalogue work and in the double stars, double star work. Um, a bit of a, a one-page bio, biology, biology one-page uh, bio. Uh, he came to Australia. You can read for yourself. Um, now he left the observatory in 1822. He had a falling out with Brisbane, and this was in fact due to the fact that he he was uh, Germanic. Uh, probably a little bit um, Asperger's, shall I say, and he uh, uh, didn't like the idea that Brisbane was uh, going to take all the credit for the hard work that he put in night after night. Um, so he left, uh, he was the first one to hold the title of, of a government astronomer in Australia, and, uh, but he eventually got dismissed, and he went to, back to Germany where he became the director of the uh, Hamburg Sternwart, which was a brand new um, observatory which was built in Hamburg um, and, uh, from 1833 to 1857. So he was by no means a, a slouch, he was a, probably a very good guy. And just that they had this falling out about, about who did the work, who got the credit, etc. And you put probably a very austere, somewhat rigid German type personality 
with a, a, a Scotchman who who uh, was reputed to have put the dogs on the uh, some on some uh, uh, person in Parramatta and threw the mayor off the boat. And you put these two personalities together with a Scottish um, uh, uh, governor who had plenty of money, and you can see almost immediately why it was such a great success. Um, so. Um, Okay, um, this is part of the uh, Dunlop. Now, Rumker himself published a list of double stars, and this is the cover sheet from that. And, uh, yes. Okay, right, now, so, so that's the background to this. Now, why double stars? Uh, you have to remember that we're talking here about the early part of the 1800s. And if you look at what hap was happening in science about that time, uh, so astronomy was moving from basically witchcraft or uh, what we now probably call astrology. It was moving from astrology through to a practical science in, in, the, in, the, idea, in the sense that it was discovering, measuring the positions of stars and working out ways of getting time so that the military, the sailors could navigate their ships. And then it was moving into another discipline which uh, was the absolutely early days of astrophysics. And this was where the, the laws of physics from Newton and um, Kepler, etc., the laws of gravity were starting to be applied to our understanding of the universe. So the laws of science were now being used to interpret what we could see. And this was a very early part of that history. And uh, the double star work was quite traditional. Uh, Many observatories in the Northern Hemisphere were looking at double stars and they were trying to measure the movement of one star relative to the other and then you can apply Newton's laws, Kepler's, actually more precisely, Kepler's laws to determine the mass of the stars and wow, all of a sudden you've got a new vision of what the universe is about. All of a sudden these little dots of light have mass yeah, and, and, and that's a really very major step forward. Um, and also double stars were interesting interesting to people such as the early Herschels who were looking at them in a hope to determine how far away they were by a mechanism of parallax whereas uh, two stars close together if you if they're all both at the same distance it doesn't work but if one happens to be really close to you and one happens to be a long way away as the earth goes around the sun the two of them interchange their positions and that interchange of position apparent interchange of position can be then triangulated at the base of the, the base line, the diameter of the Earth's axis, to determine the distance. So there's some good science hiding in all this stuff. Okay, so uh, why are we interested in this? Well, okay, it's uh, so from us now, back in the year 2000 and something or other. Uh, 2100 and something or other, 2000 and something or other, um, we, we were looking for a project and my friend, uh, my colleague, my student, uh, Dr. Letchford, uh, was actually a historian. He, has a, he already has a PhD in history. So we said, okay, well, how, can we, how can we get these two ideas together? Um, so firstly, uh, this double star work has a long history. It goes back to the mid 1700s. Uh, the, secondly, if you're measuring something at moving and it's moving slowly, uh, the, the longer you watch it, the better idea you get of the movement. So, if you can find something which has been observed back in 1700s and observe it today and it's moved from there to there, then obviously that gives you a much better idea of its, of its movement rather than trying to do it in a short time scale. Uh, now, uh, we were looking mainly, mainly for binary star systems, and, uh, but that also has an interesting uh, astrophysical context, context in that planetary systems uh, are, if you like, many double stars. Uh, for example, the solar system, we've got the Sun and we've got Jupiter. Now, Jupiter's not a, not a star. But if it was ten times bigger, it would be pretty close to a star. So 
you know, if we can understand double stars, maybe we just push back a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of understanding to finding out why some planetary systems exist. We know planetary systems exist other than around the sun, and we don't have exist around the sun, uh, and it's just another little bit of knowledge. And, you know, knowledge is a bit like trying to wear away a stone, you've got to keep, keep dropping water on it, you'll break the stone eventually, and we're trying to crack this one. Uh, okay, so it gives. So why are we doing it? It gives stellar masses. In other words, it gives the gives you the mass of the star. Uh, it gives insight into planetary systems, and it gives insight into stellar dynamics. Uh, for example, uh, in the sky, you know there are clusters of stars, such as the Pleiades or uh, any many one of the large bright clusters. Uh, they are basically a double star with extra stars thrown in. And why they all stay together is to do with the dynamics, the, inter the gravitational interaction of these things. So we're just trying to find out more information. So, uh, also, uh, subliminally, we're trying to promote history. We're trying to promote early Australian research. So we're on a, a, a roll there with that one. Um, now, what can we add in, the, in, the, in 2016? Uh, what can we add? Well, we can add, we can observe these stars ourselves and add extra data points to the to the data sets that already exist. We can go back, possibly go back and retro think some of the early observations which were made 200 years ago. Go back and see how they were made and, and see if we can improve them. Um, and we can also, uh, and if not, we can also uh, uh, at least understand the accuracy of those earlier observations, retrospective understanding, it's nothing like it, it's 2020 vision used scientifically. So we go back and look at, that, at the um, uh, early data and work out how accurate that is and then we can put that back into our modern concepts. Uh, we also hope to be able to compute new orbital parameters for these stars based on a, on a, sophisticated, on a modern sophisticated technique. Uh, at the risk of digressing slightly, uh, my colleague is now working on a power-based, uh, full, full power-based supercomputing technique of working out orbits by uh, basically Monte Carlo simulations, optimising or minimising the uncertainties in the computations. So that's what he's working on as I speak. Okay, so, uh, right, an example. Here's an example. This one is number one in, in number one in Rumka's catalogue. This Rumka, the German fellow, this is number one in his catalogue. I could have used any number. One is seen a good place to start. Uh, this is what it looks like, and uh, this is a, a, a deep photograph taken by the. Uh, uh, comes off the web, but originally I, I suspect was taken by the UK Schmidt Telescope at Siding Spring Observatory, and digitalised and placed on the web. Um, and you can see, surprisingly, two stars. Also, when you look at that, um, can you see why t double stars fascinate people? Because if you look at that picture, it's bleedingly obvious that there's something unusual going on. Why would you get two stars that bright, that close together? That's got to, that cannot be a random event. That's got to be something which, is, which comes about because of something which is not random. And we know what it is, of course. It's gravity pulling the two stars. Uh, okay, so now we go back at the historic data and have a look. Um, this, these two graphs are the uh, the movement with time of the angle between the two stars. Uh, I will come back to this actually in a few in, on a few more slides, but quickly. Uh, the science consists of measuring the position of one star in the sky with respect to the, to the other. Pick the brightest star, we call that the primary, and the, the other one's called the secondary. How about that? It's clever stuff, isn't it? Okay, so we're measuring the angle of the, of the secondary with respect to the primary. And here you can see the data. Uh, vertical axis, that angle is, in, is measured in units of degrees. And you can see on the horizontal axis date, and you can see that there's a dotted line which represents a, a slow uh, trend towards uh, 
a larger angle as time goes by. The, the, the second, the bottom graph, however, is uh, is the spread of those dots, the spread of that data about that line of best fit. Now, what we're aiming here to do is to find if that line of best fit is straight line or whether it's a curve. See, if these things are in orbit, if one's in orbit around the other, you'd expect the, the as the star moves, you expect it to curve. You wouldn't expect it to go in a straight line. So by taking first, the first guess is a straight line, take a straight line, then you look at what we call the residuals, how the data spreads around that first guess. And in the residuals you can see that, to be honest with you, there's no evidence of any curvature. Okay, you also notice that the spread, that in other words the, the ups and downness of the data gets smaller as we go to more modern observations. Why? Well, back in the 1820s, uh, the techniques, the instrumentation uh, was smaller. The integrity of the astronomer was almost certainly as good as he is today. They are today. Uh, but in this case, this was Rumka. Uh, he was using a very small, by modern day standards, Mickey Mouse telescope. And so the quality of his data is not as good. Okay, up the other end, these dots up this end would probably be done with uh, some sort of CCD imaging, in other words, a digital camera, which allows uh, software uh, that will allow fitting of the images, etc., and eliminate a whole lot of personal biases, etc. So the quality of the data historically has got better. And that's one of the things we wanted to get from this project. Okay, but it's not just the it's not just the angle that's important. It's the distance between the two stars. And again, you see uh, we have the same effect. Uh, the top one gives you the separation between the two stars, measured as a small angle from one star to the next. And that angle is a is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a degree. Now the first fraction of a, of a degree is called an arc minute and there are 60 of those and then the, the sub fraction of the arc minute is called an arc second and there are 60 of those. So each one of these units going on the vertical axis is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. Bottom graph shows you uh, again that there's no real evidence for any curvature so this is not looking good uh, and uh, uh, but again you see that the, the numbers are getting tighter as we go forward historically. Uh, and the third one also comes from the uh, literature <coughs> it's a sort of a throwaway piece of information. Top graph gives you the magnitude or the brightness of the primary star as measured in those particular dates the bottom one gives you the magnitude or brightness of the secondary star and the third graph gives you the difference between the two. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? It's throwaway information, uh, but you never know. We might find something interesting about these stars in that one of them might be a variable that was variance brightness. Okay, so where's all this leading? I hear you ask. Uh, this is leading now to the determination of the orbit of the double star. Uh, this one comes from the literature, and this is a well-known double star. It's called Alpha Centauri, and it is one of the, the famous uh, double star, bright, one of the brightest stars in the sky, Cl and certainly the closest system in the sky, and uh, and one of the most powerfully studied. And if you look closely at that, at the uh, ellipse. Um, the ellipse is made up of hundreds and hundreds of observations and each of the observations is drawn as a little green cross and the line from the green cross back to the ellipse is, um, is uh, a line joining where it was observed, green cross, to where it, we think it should have been on, in terms of the orbit. So you can see the length of the green line is a measure, if you like, of the accuracy of the particular observation. Okay, so now that we've got these observations, what do we do with those? We work out what's called the, the, the Campbell elements. 
and they are the period, the time that, it, that, the, that the orbit starts, uh, the ma semi-major axis, in other words the size, remember bearing in mind this is an ellipse, so it's the size of the axis, and the eccentricity, which says whether it's a circle or, or a long skinny ellipse, and the last three are angles, which tells how it's oriented in space relative to our observation. Okay, so you say, well, that's what that's all there is. That's alpha sen. It's been measured hundreds of times over orbit seventy odd years. So it's been measured many times, right? Well, this is actually what's really happening. Uh, the yellow uh, ellipse is the one that I just showed you. That's the ellipse fitted to the best observational data. But that's not what the real ellipse looks like at all. The real ellipse is actually the flatter one. Uh, that is the ellipse that has it would look. If you're on top of, this, top of the binary star system, looking down, that's what you'd see. And the difference is that the, the, the flatter one is called the true ellipse. And the reason it, the apparent ellipse is different is because you're looking at it at an angle. So if you could take the ellipse of the binary system and tilt it up so it was square in your face, that's what it would look like. Okay, now let's get back to our problem. Uh, did I introduce you to Rumka 1? Two little dots on a photograph, yes? Okay, well these are what the dots look like historically. Um, the, cross is the, um, the cross is the position of the primary star. The other little blob, blur, are the various measurements made uh, historically of the position of the secondary star. So you can see, and now that blob is actually 200 years of data. So you can see that this star has not moved very much in 200 years. Question now is, can we go from there back to the orbit that we want to get? Can we go back and determine those orbital parameters? Uh, and uh, that, of course, is where the power of computing comes in. We have to throw this stuff all into a, into a big supercomputer program and just crunch away until we get the minimise all of the errors in the measurements. Uh, I'm sure this thing likes triangle here. We know how far away it is, and we could looking from the Earth. We can see two dots, that dot, that dot with a small angle, we know that distance, we can work out the, the size of that baseline. And the size of that baseline is about 1,800 astronomical units. In other words, at this present time in history, 1,800 times the distance of the Earth and the Sun. Right, the equation in a box comes from Kepler, and it, it invokes what's known as Period squared, uh, 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 period squared radius cube relationship, Kepler's third law. And we can estimate the, mag the, the mass of these stars, not by their orbit, but by looking at the time spectrum, the light coming from the star. And other people have done it. We don't have the wheel. We leave the tradesmen to do that. So they come back with three solar masses for the bright star and one point zero solar masses for the faint star. So you can now bung those into Kepler's third equation and solve for P. P comes out to be about 50,000 years. So the orbit period of this secondary star is about 50,000 years, if you believe. Okay, let's have a uh, yeah. Can I go back? How do I go back? Back, back, back. Back up. All right, let's have another. Let's have another. Uh, I'll go back again. Then see if I can do this. I can. Let's go back here again. Let's now draw, work out the angle of the cross to the top of that blob, to the bottom of that blob, top to bottom, tiny little angle, and we know how how long, how many years it took for that blob to bake. It took over 200 years for that blob to occur. So. 0.7 degrees measured from the center. And it's moved, so it's moved 3.7 de degrees in 200 years. 
question, how many years does it take to go 360 degrees? Well, uh, uh, yes, now that's one way to do it, and the answer is 20,000 years. And another way to do it is to look at the uh, how these stars appear to be moving with respect to each other, blah, 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 slightly more complicated argument, 11,000 years. So you can see we've got this one really well understood. It's somewhere between 11,000 and 50,000, if you believe any of it. If you believe any of it, it's somewhere between those two. Okay. Another possibility is this is what's called a, uh, a ship in the night type of star, and that is just one star here and another star is going behind it, and it just so happens they're lined up, and in which case they're not in orbit at all, and we're just wasted. Oh, quite a bit of supercomputer uh, But that's not likely because, as I said in the early picture, this the fact that you've got two bright stars so close together is not a coincidence. They are physically bound. You can be very sure of that. Okay, so what are we doing? Now, down in, um, in Wagga Wagga, where I live, um, I've set up my own telescope to do this, and uh, I must actually thank David Platts for the generous donations. Um, and you can see I've got it located in a perfect spot for astronomical observation. You, you are not to laugh at the fact that it's cloudy. That's not the relevant question. The relevant bit is, of course, that it's stuck between the house and the garage. And, but I can tell you that uh, I do have access to a tiny little bit of the sky, and uh, uh, we are working on getting that. All right. And if anybody should happen to have a small cash donation, which they'd like to send, um, that would be very helpful to purchase a, a, a nice place to put it out in the dark sky, which is my next agenda as soon as I win the lottery. Uh, okay, so... All right, so here we go. Measuring stars. Uh, this is the two, down the bottom here is what we're actually measuring. We're measuring that angle, around the center and we're actually, and measuring the distance from center. It's called the position angle and it's called separation. Uh, the, uh, there are many reasons, very, very, there are many ways to do this nowadays and uh, we are experimenting with all these ways. Um, the limiting factors here are the Earth's atmosphere, mainly the Earth's atmosphere, uh, the quality of the um, the quality of the instrument, but in most cases the instrument fast is far better than the, the quality of the uh, of the Earth's atmosphere. So we're working on several ways to do this. We have done some direct imaging uh, with CCD camera. Uh, we've done some what is called lucky imaging, and we're now working towards building a speckle interferometer, which is of course why it should have been done in the first place. Um, I'll just go and skip that. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not going to skip that. Now, as, a, as part of this process, uh, as part of this process, we have done some secondary experiments to see how accurately we can do this. And here's the results. Uh, this is a, a this main grey picture is an image of, of a cluster in the tail of the scorpion called NGC 6231. And the other little black and white picture is what it looks like effectively through a pair of binoculars or something. Okay, um, this uh, this cluster now is, if you like, a double star gone mad. There's stars everywhere. So we can measure the distance between each of these stars, assume each pair is a double, and work out some sort of precision as to the technique. The technique here is to uh, use a piece of free software called Astrometrica, and uh, it fits the stars according to the database uh, the Strasbourg database, and then it allows you to interpolate to unknown stars uh, in the data. So, is this, does this show any promise? Well, here is the comparison double star, you know, one star to the X, the other, and um, the accuracy now that we can obtain here is, is 49 milli arc seconds um, in, in the data set. So, it means that with this little telescope in our backyard, uh, we should be able to be competitive against 
all comers, with the exception perhaps of, of interferometers or special interferometers. But just in terms of using a small telescope, backyard, uh, CCD imaging, I believe we're actually very competitive. Um, so we tried it out on, Rumpke, on one of the Rumpke doubles, and uh, let me introduce you to Rumpke number 23. Rumpke 23, of course, is like Rumpke 1, and it's not. It's further down the page. This is Rumpke 23, and uh, uh, these are our images of Rumpke 23. Uh, the image there, uh, it's also called Delta Phoenix. And the, it, so the image shows the two stars quite clearly, and the uh, graph shows uh, the profile of those two stars, in other words, the intensity distribution. What we also can do with that data is we can take a slice through the data, which I think we had to talk about this morning, and that slice gives a profile of what the two star images look like, and then we can measure how wide those star images are, and this gives us a, uh, a measure of what we call the C, the stability of the Earth's atmosphere of about 1.4 arc seconds. The separation on that double is 3.801 arc seconds, plus or minus 18 milli arc seconds. That's our first attempt. The second attempt is to go to a thing called lucky imaging. Lucky imaging is where you take a, a very large number of uh, video frames and you then sort through them. You take maybe a thousand or more video frames. You sort through them in software to pick out the very best. You then add the very best on top of each other, uh, and that way you get effectively, uh, effectively eliminate the effect of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this image was taken with a 12-inch telescope by a colleague of ours. It's the same star, and you can see immediately that the image quality is better. You can see immediately that the image quality is poorer. It's sharper, but you see how the image trails off to one side. This tells me that it, the optics in his telescope are not good. They need, it needs a small amount of adjustment. Okay, so really getting to the end, uh, how are we going to do this? Well, we have now accumulated several instruments uh, we can use. Uh, we, we're working with the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, with their telescopes, which we'll visit tomorrow and the next day. Uh, and we're also using this telescope here. This is the one that I built in University of Western Sydney. Uh, it's a 24-inch telescope. Uh, that's it in the background. It's just gone a, a rebuild. Uh, and the gentleman in the foreground is, uh, his name is Professor Miroslav Filipovic. He was my graduate student many, many years ago. Uh, he's now grown up to be a real man. And, uh, and the little thing next to him is his son, uh, who's, who I've been told is going to be a great footballer one day. But I have a sneak suspicion that having grown up with a father who dresses like that, who rebuilds telescopes like that, he, he may end up also being quite an intellect. And I certainly hope he is. OK, now, can I uh, just finish this? by asking Chris, can you follow me with, with our software here? What we're going to do, Chris, is going to... I'm going to... What I want you to do is I want you to go to my folder, load reader. I'm afraid I... Oh, hang on.
its atmosphere away. And that's why it is that uh, video cameras are used to uh, do this. And, and sophisticated video cameras, you can actually make the exposures shorter than, than a thousandth of a second and then put them all in a big bundle and stack them together, make it work that way. This is done with a with a D uh, Nikon camera and I don't have no control over the exposure time. I think it's something like about a thirtieth of a second, which is um, what, 30, milli, milli, uh, 30 milliseconds and that's probably 30 times too long to do this properly. Uh, the trick of course is that if you do a uh, if you try to do this on bright stars you, you, you can get away with it. If you want to do it on the sun hey there's no problem. Too much light. If you want to do it on faint stars of course what happens is there's not enough light uh, inside that exposure. That Not enough light coming to the camera in a thousandth of a second. It's just not enough photons. Okay, so one technique to do that is to put an image intensifier into the system which will intensify every photon that comes. Make, it, make the photons uh, brighter, if you like, uh, and uh, that helps. And that's why the, the way we, we hope to go with this project. But at the moment what you're looking at is what we have done with a standard single lens reflex camera running in video mode. Okay, so, uh, and there's, as I said, there's 169 of these frames, and if I click to the next one, which I don't want to do, you see much the same sort of thing, but it will look just slightly different. Okay? Okay, so now I'm going to uh, try and sort these images to, to get the better ones. Okay? Now, there are three ways to do this. Uh, I'm after the best ones. The first one is to, to just simply uh, sort them in terms of the of the the brightest. Now, the the ones which the images which have got the brightest star in them are the ones which are going to be the sharpest, because in every exposure you only end up with the same amount of light. So the same amount of light can either be a big peak with a little narrow base, in other words, good sharp image, or it can be a, a low flat blob with, with a big flat blob low, uh, not a sharp image. So obviously the peaky ones are going to be the sharp ones. So we sort in terms of the brightness, which I think in here is called signal, uh, no, it's called, I'm sorry, I'm trying to use this stupid, uh, in terms of the maximum. Now it's going through and looking at every image, up in the little box up here you can see that each image coming up and it's going through and sorting them into uh, the brightest ones first. Done. Done. Okay, what it's found is that frame number 84 was in fact the, the one which had the best sharp image and uh, the, uh, and the one down the bottom, whatever that is, that was the worst. Now, an alternative to that uh, is to look at what's called the signal to noise. Now, <laughs> that probably needs to be uh, understood by the person who wrote the software, but the, the word noise is a term we use to describe uh, unwanted artefacts in the data. And, uh, and signal is the, basically the, the, the artifact, the thing we want. So if you take a ratio of the thing you want and the thing you don't want, you get the signal to noise. And then you optimise that, so you take the one that's got the best signal and the poorest noise, and you sort them again. And this time you'll see that frame number 88 wins out. So there's two different ways of doing it. You get two different answers. All right, the third way um, is the good old fashioned way which is really good for a young person to do not me, I'm too old for this uh, it's called a visual inspection and what it's doing now is it's going to make for me 169 thumbnails eventually it makes 169 thumbnails and I can go through manually now look at each one and say that's good, don't like that one that's good, don't like that one. 
and I can now reject the poor ones and, and as a consequence I can improve the quality, overall quality of the final product. Okay, Dave. So uh, let's not do that. Let's not do that. I don't. I. Uh, I'm not going to live long enough to, to, uh, to do everything that way. So what uh, what we have now is the sorted in terms of signal to noise. Right now we want to say ask the question: Do we want to use all of them or not? How many? Well, that's up to me. Um, so I don't know. I, I, my experience has shown that most of them. Are actually work very well. Uh, you don't have to really reject any, but why don't I just say no? Let's let's be a bit ruthless about all this, and I'm only going to use half. Uh, I'm going to use the the best 50%, right? So if, if I now flash down here, ah oh dear, I'd really give a fortune, give my kingdom for a mouse, uh, a mouse, a mouse, my kingdom for a mouse. Uh, you see now that I've, I've accepted with a tick uh, the first uh, half of those and the other ones have been rejected based on the signal to noise. Okay, so now we're going to say, well, that's all fun, Graham. Is there anything else you want to do? And the answer is yes, I do. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add them all together. And you'll see down here there is a thing called an alignment box and the alignment box has drawn a box around the, the stars. And, uh, uh, and I can actually set the size of that box if I want. I'm not going to worry about that because at the moment it's set to a default and the default looks good to me. Okay, okie dokie. Right, now it's going through and taking all those in. they are coincident with the previous one. So they bundle them all up, so to speak. It's called shift and add. Shift and add. And what I've done is I'm only using half of them, so now I have shift and add of the best 50%. Looking good? Right. Up the top, and, and there's the image there, and up the top is the uh, uh, enlargement of the actual image. If you look in the yellow window, you'll see that uh, the profile now across the image, uh, you can see the ratio of the um, brightness of the two stars, and you can see the separation of them. And uh, uh, and down the bottom there, see a little box that says 9 by 9. If I twiddle with that, if I twiddle with that, uh, I can make the... I can make the box get bigger around the star. So now I can say, I can now squeeze that box down. I don't want to make it bigger, I want to make it smaller. So I squeeze that box down. So get in the gold. Okay, over to here, I'm going to call that component A. Click back to here. me for an answer? Good work. Goes to show these students are not as dumb as they look. Ouch, he says. Component B. Okay. Right. Now I go to, this is the clever part of the software and I thank the, the gentleman who wrote it profusely for this. It now goes through and measures the, the position of the two stars. We're basically done with that. So why don't I now um, try and enlarge this box for you and uh, what I might do is I might just leave it like that for the time being. Okay, now this for each image of the 169 divided by 2 images uh, I, I'm given the position of the centre of that star of star A uh, measured here to three significant figures in terms of the pixels. So it's fitted the pixel to be 64.0095 pixels in the x direction and 
uh, and the y direction to be 64.092 pixels and then it gives the uh, intensity which is the number, the number of photoelectrons inside that star image as being 500 and uh, something or other and I, I, I probably should expand this out to see more significant figures uh, and uh, then, then star B I got X and Y X and Y for star B the intensity of star B yes okay so both stars have been fitted for position X and Y and for brightness bright intensity quick sophisticated okay now we go to page two of this and page two now works out for me the separation between the two stars and the angle I do have to confess that we should also put in into the top header here some information concerning the camera and also some information concerning any pair of stars which we know nearby well, what's called the calibrators. I haven't done that. Uh, obviously I will at some point. Okay, so now for each measurement, each frame, I get a number, I get R, which is the, uh, uh, is the uh, a residual, the error in the... Uh, okay, let me, let, me give, let me read the first line to you. First line, theta, the angle between the two stars, 345 degrees. I'm oh, sorry, 300 degrees, 0.45. 300.45 degrees. <coughs> the, the separation between the two, 4.818 pixels. Now, that number, when a, those two numbers, when calibrated against a standard set, which we can load into the top boxes, will give me the answer in degrees and arc seconds on the sky. The two things I'm after, right? I'm not really after the intensity. Okay, then it gives me a uh, jumping to the jumping one column. Next one is the uncertainty in that measurement. So for theta, so it's what it's saying really is this is 300.45 degrees plus or minus 0.14, and the angle, uh, sorry, the separation is 4.818 uh, pixels plus or minus 0.045 right now uh, they, those uh, they are coloured uh, green means good right blue means she's cool man and red means don't touch that ok so what I can now do is I go up here to sort and I do let's sort the angle first oh uh, hang on am I supposed to do something here yep. oh descending or ascending well let's do uh, uh, ascending okay let's see what happens when we do that right so okay so what it's done is taken the the fourth row <coughs> and sort them in, into biggest first smallest last and you can see the first three are really oh, not good so actually I'm just going to change that now. I'm going to go back and, and sort it into descending. What, is that what I did? I'm going to go back and change it to ascending. Sorry. Sorry? Help? Oh, yes, yes. Negative positive. Yes, you're right about that. Okay. So what I can now do is go through and eliminate that particular data set. So I've already thrown away 50% of my 50% uh, of my data. I might have to throw away another couple. The trick is not to throw away them all. When you throw them all away, you've got nothing left, right? So <laughs> you've got to be smart and know when to stop. Okay, so I can now eliminate that data line and go back and do it again. And and by doing that successively, I can eliminate the ones that I think are bad and that's basically based on in this case based on the colour you know red is bad uh, get rid of reds sounds like a political statement 
Okay, then up in the, when that's all done, up in the uh, box above, you'll see theta and rho, and, and then you've got underneath a little red sigma. So they are the final values, they are the average values of the columns, and the sigma is the standard mathematical form for uh, uncertainty of the sample, and that gives me the the So now I can say the angle is 300.31 degrees, plus or minus, uh, no. Sorry, well, just the moment, that's what it says, and that's not what we want. It's saying 300, I'm sorry, I was reading that. It's 300, 2.13 degrees, and the separation is 4.7713 plus or minus 0.17. How smooth is that? You put that into a Excel data file and you do that thousands and thousands of times and you go to the next bit. Um, so uh, another thing you can do is you can actually cut that data set, uh, just simply scribe and cut and put in the log, in the, what's called the log, scribe and cut and then you can paste it directly into Excel so you can, any other sophisticated computation you want to do uh, it can be done in Excel so it solves the problems. Okay, so that's my little talk on double stars. Uh, it wasn't actually. It was a star talk in three parts. It was uh, an excellent talk by me about double stars and, and Dunlop. Dunlop uh, I told a whole lot of folly by David Pratt's trying to show what the uh, computer was doing. And another excellent piece of work by me described some of the observational techniques used in uh, astronomy to determine uh, star positions. All right, thanks guys. Any questions? Questions? I expect one. Well, yes, sir. Loudly. Um, with this program here, I notice in the sort of thumbnail image in the top left, there's a lot of little strands. Does it average those out into a haze around the star, or does it try to cut them off? Uh, what it does is each, having boxed off the two stars, what it does is then it looks uh, not within the box, but it looks outside of the box for a shape. It's looking for a Gaussian shape. Most of that shape is in the box, but if it's a bit outside, it will, it will incorporate that. Okay. So it's sort of cutting the outside. Okay. Remember I was saying about how uh, the Earth's atmosphere basically mucks up the image. And as I said, if you you can actually see it there. When these images are flying through the software, you actually see the, the stars yeah. twinkling. And that's, that is really just twinkling, okay? It's twinkle, twinkle, little star. Uh, I wish we didn't have it. Okay. Uh, what, I was going to say, what happens is, is that if you had no atmosphere at all, uh, a la Hubble telescope, right, then the, the size of the dot that you get is determined by size of the telescope. It's uh, it's called the resolving power of the telescope. Are you familiar with this, guys? Yeah. It's it's 1.22 lambda over d. Lambda's wavelength d is diameter. Okay. But the Earth's atmosphere moves it around in such a way that the resultant image will always be a Gaussian. Well, at least it will always approximate a Gaussian shape. And that the Gaussian is standard uh, bell shaped curve and it has a mathematical form which I'm sure Mr. Platts will explain to you at some stage. Um, okay, so that's a Gaussian shape and that's what we'll have. So now if you've got, if you know that's what the star image is going to look like, if you know it's going to look like a Gaussian, well then the best thing to do is to get a piece of software which takes a, a Gaussian already yeah, mathematically stretches it out, stretches it out.
uh, and, you know, and to such a point that uh, uh, actually I think the correct answer is because of, of Jupiter but the, uh, the, the system is a very stable extremely stable uh, in double stars uh, what you need to make to break up the stability is a third object now uh, if uh, for example another star should come close to our, to our system it might disrupt